Welcome to Hot Chips 26. Session 2. Mobile Processors. Uh, welcome to session two of Hot Chips. Uh, my name is Partha Ranganathan from Google. Uh, so the first one is, uh, this is the session on mobile processors, and uh, we have a really good session lined up with lots of cool demos and everything. Uh, so the first talk is uh, from uh, NVIDIA, and the presenter is uh, Michael Ditty. And Mike is a manager in the, the Tegra system architecture. Uh, he's been working at NVIDIA for the past nine years. Uh, he's worked on a lot of different stuff, video encoding, decoding, uh, hardware design, uh, uh, system level performance analysis, most recently uh, GPU architecture, so looking at the power improvements for the Kepler core. And uh, he was the architecture lead for the um, uh, integration of the GPU into the uh, Tegra K1. And uh, he uh, drove the uh, architecture bring up uh, all the way through to production. And now he's working on SOCs. So, so um, with that, uh, Mike. Hey, so today we're going to be talking about NVIDIA's uh, Tegra K1 uh, system on a chip. And uh, so a little intro on what that is, what that means. Um, so our Tegra K1 chip is an SOC meant to go in mobile devices, um, starting from phones all the way up to, to notebook-style devices. Um, and so as you can see, it has a variety of things. It has your, your IOs, your USB security engine, um, a variety of blocks that you expect to see in some kind of uh, SOC or, or computer PC. Um, and then we have some highlights to it. So of course, the big highlight to Tegra K1 is our Kepler GPU, um, 192 CUDA core, bringing the desktop Kepler architecture down into the mobile space. And that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, also, we, we have two SKUs of this chip. So we have a 32-bit variant available now and a 64-bit variant also. So we have the 32-bit uh, variant is made up of the uh, four Cortex-A15s, um, the latest revision that improves uh, performance and power. Um, and then we have the 64-bit version with NVIDIA's custom uh, dual Denver CPU, which uh, Daryl will be talking about later. So I'm going to not go into that that much here. Um, we also have a new camera uh, ISP architecture, um, 1.2 gigapixel throughput. Um, support for up to 100 megapixel sensor, um, and, uh, and there's actually two instances of that to get to that performance, and we'll talk about that a little more also. Um, in terms of power and efficiency, um, this is using 28 HPM uh, for improved per, per watt over previous um, Tegra 4 designs, and, uh, and of course there's a display that can drive high resolution panels. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? So we're going to start uh, with a little intro into how Kepler got into mobile. And, uh, and talk a little bit about the story there, um, how we got there, what it looks like now. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on the Tegra ISP architecture and how it fits into our computational uh, imaging strategy, um, a little bit about heterogeneous power management, um, and then what this chip enables in mobile. Um, so, and then I'm going to give a little intro to the demo that, that we'll have. Um, so Kepler. Uh, Back about four years ago, as we were looking at what to build in the future for mobile, um, this picture on the left is uh, ES 2.0, DirectX 9. This was sort of cutting edge uh, you know, back four years ago. Um, and of course, on the desktop, we had much more capabilities and, uh, and interesting features. Um, and so we realized back then that mobile was moving quickly, moving quickly to converge and feature set with the desktop. Um, moving quickly to add capabilities uh, that, and support use cases that previously had been desktop features. So we realized this was a time we had to make a decision. Do we continue to enhance the Aurora mobile architecture, or, or do we jump to this Kepler thing, which um, Kepler made a huge advance in performance per watt. And, and as we looked at Kepler, it started to become feasible that if you, if you take off this PCI Express, if you remove this high-power graphics DRAM 
and you start to look at the mobile space and how this would look in mobile, um, you know, play with the voltage frequency points, it starts to become possible that Kepler could fit into this mobile power envelope. And so we decided then to, to make that jump, um, and, and that's how Kepler got into mobile. Um, it has full support for all the, the latest standards, um, OpenGL ES 3.1, along with the new Android extensions that were just announced, um, full OpenGL 4.4 support, um, DX12, you know, falling under that, you have tessellation, compute shaders, um, the ASTC compression format, um, it basically supports all the feature set that anyone is asking for in mobile or desktop space. Um, so our roadmap now has moved to be aligned to the desktop architecture from mobile. And the great thing there is that means that not now, not only now have we merged those two roadmaps, but going forward, all of the improvements we see and invest on in the desktop will flow right down into mobile. And the investments we invest in for mobile will flow right into the desktop. And so it's very exciting. Um, and it shows that Tegra K1 is not the first, but will continue to be uh, a line of graphics uh, leadership. So some, some tech specs, um, Tegra K1, uh, huge increase in floating point power from Tegra 4. This is FP32. Um, also, we went to a unified architecture. So Tegra 4 was a, uh, a split architecture with separate vertex and pixel shaders. Um, so we, we now can do 384 pixels, uh, FP32 ops per clock. Um, and then we have a variety of other specs here, you know, 10x the Z, right? Um, we have Z call, um, increased rasterization and texture throughput. Um, and, you know, what all these features really mean, summed up, is that uh, this is ready for next gen content, deferred renders and different features that historically haven't been on mobile, um, but now are enabled by Tiger K1. So, talking a little more about what is the uh, you know, implementation in Tiger K1. Uh, it is based around one of the Tegra, uh, sorry, one of the Kepler SMX um, compute units. Um, that has 192 CUDA cores. Um, those cores have a unified memory cache. Um, it has a variety of dedicated accelerators uh, around geometry and tessellation. We have hardware Z call and hardware rasterization. So those fixed pipelines are very efficient. And then when it gets to the shading horsepower and whatnot, it's very, uh, very powerful. Um, now, that's all about taking Kepler into mobile. Now, what did we have to do beyond just you know, take one SMX core and drop it in? Um, well, we had to invest more. Um, Kepler had made huge strides in power efficiency um, around clock and power gating. Um, so we took that to the next level, further enhanced the clock and power gating uh, implementation, um, made it to uh, be more efficient across workloads and uh, we added more power gating. And then we also, for the first time, added rail gating, um, which in the case of an SFC, makes a lot of sense to be able to shut down the GPU when you're not using it. Um, architecturally, we also made some changes. While the core units had been greatly enhanced from, uh, for Kepler, there was a variety of areas around that core where it was built to scale to high performance and, uh, and for larger numbers of SMs and uh, more interacting units. So we looked at a lot of that and we said, you know, where is it that we can optimize these data paths? Uh, you know, this included things like instead of sharing wires to, and, and muxing them, we could have more direct connect, um, which may be a little more area impactful, but the per, per watt win in this case was, was uh, positive. So there were a variety of architectural changes we made. Um, another thing we did was that we found that there were a number of cases in in mobile or in composition workloads where we, we bypass, or the shader is basically doing a copy. And we realized, hey, we can bypass the shader, shut off those high power units, and save more power. Um, also, as shown in the last slide, the GPU L2 cache um, you know, per SMX is significantly larger than we've done on the desktop in the past. So we increased that L2 cache size to improve memory efficiency, improve uh, reduce memory bandwidth, um, and the compression from the desktop feature set was made to work in mobile. Um, along with that, we greatly improved and pushed the work reduction features um, that already existed in, uh, in Kepler and made it uh, more suitable for some of the low power workloads. 
um, improved early Z, improved the uh, call, different calling modes. Um, so that is you know, the, the high level, and we'll get into a bit about what some of these power gating features and stuff look like in, a, um, in the implementation. Um, now I'm going to talk a bit here and switch to the ISP. So as I mentioned, this has two next-gen ISPs in it, total throughput of 1.2 gigapixels. Um, so that's 600 megapixels for each ISP. Um, you know, 4096 focus points, 14-bit input, um, and then, as I mentioned, 100 megapixel camera. Now, most interesting here is sort of this next bullet point, which is we took the ISP and we said, wow, we want to be able to fit this in a computational pipeline. So that means we want this to be able to be reconfigurable. So we want to be able to select what data paths are actually used, what steps we actually process. We want to allow interoperability to go between the ISP and the GPU more efficiently and um, more so than our previous architecture allowed. Um, and so, of course, putting the Kepler in there with full compute, um, we wanted to take advantage of that. Um, and then also the ISP um, can source from either memory or straight from the camera input. So we can be very efficient and stream things right into the ISP, or we can be more flexible and go to, to memory. Um, so what does it look like from a software architecture and, and hardware architecture perspective? Well, you have the camera coming in here on the left side, and, uh, and then you have going down the pipeline. We can pass this workload to CPU, GPU, um, at any point along the pipe. Um, so we sort of have the pre-processing stages and the post-processing stages, and the ISP fits in the middle. And so some of this is a, a, a software architecture enabled by the new um, hardware architecture. Um, the key thing is we can, we can pass this work to the GPU and allow GPU compute to happen, allow CPU to happen, and based on OEMs or uh, NVIDIA's driver stack needs, uh, we can flexibly change this pipeline to uh, make the work, or make different imaging cases possible. Um, so that's a, a quick overview of, of those. Um, now I'm going to get into a little bit of interesting, let's talk about power. Um, so GPU power management, right? There are two aspects of GPU power management uh, in, a, in a system like Tegra K1. One is uh, bringing down the active power. So when you're actually doing work, doing that efficiently um, and at an efficient operating point. The other thing is that when we're finished with that work, it's important to shut off as fast as possible. So as I talked about earlier, multiple levels of clock gating enable us to quickly transition from a very active state down and transition to idle and low power, shutting off most of the dynamic power of the system. Um, from there, um, depending on the workload, the use case, and the heuristics we have engaged, um, we can enable power gating of the GPU pipeline um, fairly dynamically within a use case. Um, and then depending on if you need the GPU or what you're doing, we also can rail gate. And so both of those are saving significant amount of leakage, um, and rail gating saves all dynamic and leakage power of the GPU. And so we can pretty aggressively get into each of these power states um, depending on what the system is doing uh, to save power and to take that big GPU and, and shut it off quick. Um, now talking a bit about gaming, uh, I want to bring up a use case here and, and talk about the difficulties of heterogeneous compute and power management. Um, so in a multi-core gaming scenario, you're using the, the CPU, GPU, um, display, audio, um, and of course you have, while in GPU land we would like to say you have no CPU or the CPU stays out of your way, there's significant amounts of work done on the CPU, right? We have artificial intelligence, physics maybe being done there, and then you have the rendering pipeline being driven from the CPU. So, um, you know, what that looks like, what units are active, uh, just a little picture to, to represent that. Um, display and audio here are fairly fixed workloads, so um, the hard part is Kepler the Kepler GPU and the CPU and managing the power between those. So let's talk a little bit about what can happen in that case. So here we have two diagrams. Um, the first one is showing really an ideal power management scenario, right? We all want to see the CPU run fast or run it, get its job done quickly, send its work to the GPU, the GPU finish it in one chunk, and all of our power states that everyone's worked so hard on, all of our different features will kick in and we'll, we'll save power for the rest of the frame. Um, 
As I mentioned, that's what we like to see, and that happens in some cases. Um, but then we have the much more interesting and realistic case of, hey, there's sometimes interactions between the CPU and GPU. Now, the interesting thing here is that we have a case where the CPU sends some work to the GPU and then waits for some part of it to finish. And there's some overlapping time where they're active. There's also some idle time. Um, but in the end, these units are active for the same amount of time. Um, and that's important because if you look at a, like a load-based dynamic scaler, it looks like both of these are running at their most efficient point. And in this case, maybe they are, depending on where you are in the perf and power curves. But in many cases, you're not. And so a very difficult thing in modern SOCs as we get to more and more heterogeneous environments is how do we determine how to best steer the power, where to increase or decrease uh, power management um, or clocks. And, uh, and you know, you ha we have to look at more than just active time, because here we have two very different cases with the same active time for each unit. Um, so Tegra K1 has a variety of governors looking at this and trying to optimize this. We have a variety of hardware hooks that enable uh, optimization around this. Um, but it's definitely a case as we go more and more heterogeneous that becomes more difficult to solve and, uh, and is, we're continuing to work on. Um, now another case, let's talk about video, right? So if we're doing video processing and including both the ISP and some Kepler GP, GPU work, um, my example here is LTM, uh, which is local tone mapping, where we try and bring out some uh, details in the picture that are not otherwise seen. And there, it's a little over-exaggerated for the slides um, to make it visible, but uh, this is a very interesting case of heterogeneous computing. Um, so here we have many of the units active. Um, and so this is a case where you know, power management may decide to do very different things. On the left side, we have sort of a frame, one frame execution of a video pipeline. So we have ISP processing the data, uh, CPU taking that in, and then GPU. Uh, we hand it back and forth. Um, the interesting case here is when we move to the right. If the, if the pipeline latency on the left side here is too long and we want to reduce that, there's a variety of knobs we have. And so sometimes we look at the GPU in these mobile devices and we say, how can we ever use that much performance? And this is a perfect example of here the GPU is only active for 20% of the time. But we may choose to run it twice as fast and save 10% of the total time by just using a higher frequency on the GPU. That may or may not um, burn more power, depending on where you are on the VF curve. And, um, but it is a, a use case where this may not have been possible running it at half the speed. We may not have met the user experience requirements. And so running it faster is required to get the best experience for the user. And there may be a small power hit to that, or we might be able to do it um, for free. And so these are cases where the burst mode uh, of these different units and the governors kicking in higher performance um, can improve the uh, user experience and the use cases that are uh, available. So we're going to jump into this, into what does this enable? So I have here just a couple benchmark points to show sort of how Tiger K1 is doing. Um, I, uh, so we have here the fastest competitor I could find if you go to all these websites. Um, and I wanted to compare Tegra's performance to that, um, or Tegra K1's performance. So in Graphics Bench 3, Manhattan, this is an uh, OpenGL ES3 game. Uh, we're over 70% faster than the closest competition when we look at our Shield tablet device that's shipping. Um, we have Graphics Bench 3, which is an OpenGL 2 game. Uh, here I have the Shield Portable. Um, Shield Portable is a Tegra 4 device. Uh, it also represents one of the fairly high-performing parts of last year. And so this is a great example of uh, how far Tegra K1 is compared to most of the devices on the market right now, um, well over 2x the, the speed. And then we have the, we're still 60% uh, higher than the closest competition. Um, now, those are both GPU. Uh, I mentioned, Daryl will talk more about CPU, but I do have one system benchmark here. This includes CPU, GPU. Um, and again, there were 20% higher performance, um, which is just a, a huge jump. Um, and, that, and again, the Competitor X is a 2014 SOC um, latest generation. Um, so it is not a last year design. Um, now, so 
this benchmark horsepower, all of these features around ISP and GPU, uh, one of the big things this enables is we can scale from the phone and the phone power envelopes all the way up to the clamshell. So it's a huge scaling across that we're able to do. Um, these are all examples of devices that different Tegra chips are in, and all of them are devices that we can fit Tegra K1 into. Um, so what I haven't talked about too much is mobile compute. Um, this is a very interesting area, uh, especially when we have the visual computing things that people are looking at. Um, mobile compute can greatly enhance this. Um, so CUDA is uh, one of our APIs we support. We have full CUDA support on uh, Tegra K1. Um, part of that is also our VisionWorks toolkit um, that enables some uh, optimized libraries. Um, and then the other thing we support here is render scripts. So we have full render script support, GPU accelerated. Um, this is available on a variety of development devices. So we have the Jetson, which is enabling people to run different uh, robotics workloads. Also, uh, a variety of embedded developers are using this to prototype potential future products they're looking at. Um, we have a very interesting Google device, Tango Tablet, um, which is enabling people to capture the 3D environment around them. And all of that is being done using GPU compute and a variety of camera and sensors. Um, and then, of course, there's the mobile compute on automotive. That is very uh, an up and coming area as we get to driver, driverless cars and other things. Uh, mobile computers, can, or sorry, automotive compute and vision is going to be more and more important. So, in terms of compute, just this last week, uh, the CompuBench RS was released, a render script benchmark. Uh, it's made up of seven or eight subtests. Um, and uh, I wanted to just give a quick number. Um, these are all available on the CompuBench render script website, so you can go check out exactly where Tiger K1 compares. But we are, uh, on average, 6x faster than the competition. Um, and so this, this is really an example of both Kepler's um, history in GPU compute and how we've you know, had products in the market for the last eight years with that support, along with the deep software stack we've developed over those years that quickly enable us to bring up things like render script support. Um, so where can you buy this, right? Um, just in the last month, we've had a number of uh, devices announced. Um, Shield tablet is now available. Uh, we actually have some outside you guys can try. Uh, Xiaomi Mi Pad is available in China, a um, great device. Um, and then just this morning, the Acer Chromebook 13 was announced, uh, which is a Chromebook powered by a Tegra K1. Um, so those are all great uh, examples of things you can do uh, and great devices. Um, so talking about Shield Tablet a little more, um, rather than doing a demo up here where I, I show you playing with it, I instead wanted to give you a little intro, and then we have a demo outside that you guys can come experience, and it'll be out there for the rest of the day. Um, so Dabbler is a stylus demo where you can draw. And um, this is interesting because it's using both compute and GPU acceleration to generate uh, very unique and interesting effects. Um, so on the water, we have a watercolor mode where we're using GPU compute to simulate realistic water. Um, and it simulates interaction between the canvas and other colors. Uh, we have an oil painting mode where you can draw and the 3D model of the oil allows you to do realistic lighting and uh, along with the canvas interaction. Um, so it's a very cool experience. It's, one of, it's a very unique experience where um, the consumer is actually being impacted by GPU compute. Um, and the last thing we have is um, the fact that we can do this all on the GPU means we can do it very quickly. And we have an optimized path so that we can do you know, stylus to ink or pen to ink latency is below 40 milliseconds. Um, in terms of touch and tablets, that's um, much way below a lot of other solutions here. And then we have optimized GPU rendering paths to do all this very quickly and get that picture to you. So it's a very interactive experience. Um, some much more artistic people than I made very pretty pictures with this. Um, and uh, I think this was some of our engineers who were testing the application. Um, but it just shows what's possible. And I recommend that everyone, um, over the next few breaks, it will be out there, so you don't have to race out there um, for the first one. But you can try out Dabbler. You can experience it um, and check out Shield Tablet and gaming. Um, so in conclusion here, we've talked about how Tegra K1 is bringing new capabilities into mobile. Um, with its compute capabilities, with its full uh, graphics support of 
up to OpenGL 4.4 uh, with its advanced imaging pipeline. Um, this is going to enable a new, uh, a new set of use cases and a new set of capabilities for the developer. Um, and we're excited to see what people come up with. Um, it has great performance, over 2x of the current mobile devices. Um, and then it enables new platforms and ecosystems. Things like the Tango tablet uh, wouldn't be possible without a great compute solution. Um, new ecosystems around um, compute in the car and, uh, and portable gaming devices. And uh, we're looking forward to what everyone, what the developers are able to do now that we've put this technology out there. Um, so I'd like to lastly just give a special thanks to uh, the GPU Integra teams at NVIDIA. Um, this was a long process, a, a lot of work across the business units to work together and figure out how to fit this thing in. Um, now look back, you know, as on slides it looks easy, but the, the details and the work we did was great and great teamwork across the company. So I want to thank all those people, many of which are here today. So. Thanks, Mike. Um, any questions? So please come to the mics on the two sides and uh, introduce yourself uh, before asking for any questions too. question on the um, benchmarks you are using. Um, so you showed the performance comparison against your competitor X. What about the performance per um, energy, even as of energy like volt? Um, how do you compare with your competitor? And what about the uh, thermal aspects as well? Sure. So, um, you know, I, I didn't put any performance or perf per watt slides in here partially because we've shown them at another, a number of other occasions. So I wanted to give some different data points. Um, so we, I don't have any specific numbers to give here today. Um, in the Jetson white paper that we released when we announced, when we announced Jetson back in uh, April, there was a variety of comparison points at equal performance or equal power to some competitor devices. Um, in general, we, are, um, we beat the competition at most ISO performance points. We're, we are better power at ISO performance, or we are better performance at ISO perf or ISO power. Uh, and you achieve that within the same thermal envelope as well, or you actually, you know, well, right. So when I'm talking about perf per watt, that would be uh, same power level, so same thermal uh, envelope also. The, uh, um, the second question is the um, compression you did. The L2 cache and compression is one of your strategy of improving the power efficiency. Could, could you speak up just a little oh, bit? The second question is regarding the, thank you, uh, is the compression. Mm -hmm. um, you listed it as one of the um, strategies of mm -hmm. for the power efficiency. So I'm just wondering that, so what is the, um, well, do you actually perform the compression, decompression in general, or do you actually do it selectively? And then what is the, um, you know, power or the cost in terms of doing that as well? Uh, so we apply um, compression across a variety of surface formats um, for uh, many of the, the render surfaces. Um, I believe some of those are publicly available in Kepler white papers. Um, we match the compression capabilities of the desktop GPU. So that's done for, um, GPU rendered surfaces and uh, you know texture f uh, surfaces are compressed with the texture compression. And, um, so it, it, we have a variety of compression capabilities. Um, it varies based on surface type and um, it's, and uh, yeah, on surface type. Bob Stewart, Stewart Research Enterprises. Mm -hmm. uh, the television industry is moving to 8K displays and uh, source generation. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, Samsung is using edge enhancement to achieve a real improvement over NTSC apparent resolution. Uh, is this architecture of the Tegra Suitable for that type of application? Suitable for that type of uh, post-processing? Yes. Um, so it is definitely flexible in the compute capability, um, depending on the exact algorithm uh, and bandwidth requirements of the algorithm uh, you're thinking about. I'm not sure if it would fit on this mobile platform. 
uh, but it is definitely capable of a variety of compute and, uh, and filtering type uh, implementations. Um, I'm not sure, I can't speak to the specific one you mentioned, uh, edge enhancement, if we have enough horsepower to do that. We are, I think there is at least one TV announced with uh, Tegra K1, but I can't say what they're, what they're doing specifically on that core. Oh, there's a question there. Okay. Irma Esmer. Oops. Um, and I was wondering, you mentioned how you can increase the frequency of the GPU when it's needed. Would you be able to elaborate a little bit the mechanism you use to do that uh, switching back and forth and changing frequency? Between uh, GPU and CPU? Yes. Um, it varies based on the use case. There's a number of metrics in the system we can look at in terms of, uh, partially it comes from where are we on the voltage frequency curve. You know, if we, uh, if we would like, to enable more performance, and, it's, and we think we may be bottlenecked, we can make speculative decisions and see how that works out. Um, we also can uh, look at a variety of metrics, including performance, to try and uh, tune how the system is um, acting. I can't go into more detail than that. OK, let's thank Michael once again. So our uh, next uh, presentation is from AMD, and the speaker is Dan Bouvier. Uh, Dan is um, AMD's uh, client products portfolio architect and also an AMD senior technical fellow. Uh, he leads the architectural definition for uh, AMD's mobile and desktop APU products. Uh, he was the lead architect for the Kaveri APU that you're going to hear about. And prior to joining uh, AMD in 2009, he was the uh, processor CTO for Applied Micro, where he was leading the architecture for APM's uh, PowerPC processors. And before Applied Micro, Dan spent nine years at Freescale and Motorola, where he was uh, director for advanced processor architecture for the PowerPC product family. So let's welcome Dan. Thank you, Partha. Thank you, Partha. So I'm excited to be here uh, to talk about uh, Kaveri, um, and, and more specifically, it seems very appropriate to be talking about heterogeneous computing and, and how that applies after Mike's talk earlier. Um, this uh, Kaveri is, is really a fulfillment of many years of vision in AMD to, to get, uh, 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 to fully unleash the horsepower that can be found in combining a general purpose processor, uh, in this case an x86, with a, a very high performance and scale up uh, that's happening on the GPU. So let's uh, get into this a bit. Um, so first of all, uh, when we talk about our design choices uh, as we put uh, uh, Kaveri together, uh, this, this took on uh, various modes here. So, so first of all, uh, we always think about compute and, and increasing the uh, compute capability. In this case, uh, not only increasing the performance of our x86, but, but also adding a significant improvement on our graphics processor, in this case uh, up to about 45% more GPU performance. Um, we combine that then with a um, heterogeneous UMA uh, memory system. Uh, we brought in the latest game uh, technology. Um, as you probably are aware, AMD has been very much in the news uh, around game platforms. Uh, and so this provided a great opportunity to kind of leverage some of uh, uh, our learnings there and, uh, and technology. Uh, one of the things I'll point out here is, is that uh, uh, not only did we bring in uh, the visual aspects, but we also brought in this notion of what's called true audio technology, which is a, a, an array of DSPs to do uh, spatial uh, audio experience uh, with the processor. Um, and then, uh, and also on this, uh, we also brought a, uh, what I think of as a bare metal API called Mantle, which is available now, uh, that exploits and bypasses the, um, the uh, Microsoft uh, uh, driver, uh, DX driver, and just runs the game straight down on the bare metal. And uh, uh, there's some great games out there right now, like Battlefield 4, that just uh, take on a huge boost in performance and frame rate. Uh, and last but not least, we had a very wide range of, of products we wanted to put this in. So uh, the product uh, or the, the, uh, the SOC had to cover from a 15 watt to 95 watt uh, TDP. Uh, as an overview, just kind of fly through things here and, and show you what we had in the part. Um, first of all, uh, we bring our, our uh, third generation of our bulldozer family core in and, and made some enhancements there, but it's a quad core uh, x86 CPU. 
um, that's combined with an eight compute unit or eight core uh, graphics engine uh, using our graphics core next uh, architecture. And then we also coupled that with uh, our next generation of universal video decoder and, uh, and uh, video codec engine, and, uh, and then the True Audio uh, DSP accelerator. Um, this is uh, fed with a 128-bit uh, dual-channel memory uh, controller DDR3, which uh, gives us about 32 gigabyte, or sorry, 34 gigabytes per second of, of peak bandwidth. Um, the GPU in this can sustain on the order of 85 to 90 percent uh, efficiency uh, when we're when we're touching that that memory um, because of the way we've uh, um, enhanced that uh, that interface. Um, and then last but not least, we bring in a PCI Express uh, Gen 3 uh, 16 lane interface. That's to connect up a uh, optional uh, uh, discrete graphics uh, often used in, in some of the mobile and desktop applications. I have the obligatory die photo. We all have to have those. Um, and uh, so the die size of this is about 245 millimeters squared. Uh, and this is in 28 nanometer technology. Uh, we had a transistor count of about two, just shy of two and a half billion transistors. The most important point to point out here is, is notice the size of the GPU compared to the CPU. And, and you can see there where we uh, emphasized uh, the balance there. Uh, it's about uh, just shy of 50% of the die area. A little bit about the steamroller cores that are, are used in this. Um, this is a, uh, a quad core. Uh, there are two uh, clusters of dual uh, uh, core um, uh, in this, that uh, each one sharing an L2. Um, we made some uh, pretty significant enhancements, especially on the front end of the, uh, of the pipeline. Uh, we reduced the iCache uh, miss, uh, misses by about 30%. Um, we uh, reduced the mispredicted branches by about 20%, and we uh, increased the scheduling efficiency by about, by about 5 to 10%. And really, this was through adding more resources, uh, doubling BTBs, and so on in the core. Um, we also um, uh, increased, uh, like I said, the, the amount of dispatches, improved dispatch performance um, on the order of 25%. And what we did there is, is we doubled the, um, uh, the decoders on this. So now there's independent decoders per, uh, per core in there where they were shared in the previous generations. Um, and so uh, last but not least, we increased the iCache size to 96K byte uh, three-way set associative uh, iCache and again, uh, improved uh, uh, some of the instruction efficiency. On the GPU side, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is a graphics core next GPU. This is the same family that I presented last year, our Cabini uh, value processor. This and then all the way to our R9-290 water-cooled um, big uh, GPU, uh, all fought based on the same architecture. And, uh, and, and so uh, this one has eight compute units. Each compute unit is, is capable of running 16 single precision float operations uh, per cycle. And so uh, we have a lot of, uh, of horsepower there. Um, each compute unit has an asynchronous um, uh, compute engine, ACE engine, so they are all independently dispatched. And so again, uh, great for computing because we can set up and queue different work or parallel work uh, uh, that's coordinated depending on what workload's going in. Um, the Kaveri uh, uh, APU enhancements, looking at the rest of chip, uh, so first thing we touched was the memory system. So uh, as part of doing a, a, a heterogeneous UMA memory system, we had to uh, uh, make some adjustments to the memory system. And this was to add coherency between the GPU and CPU. So besides the existing 256-byte uh, uh, data path between the uh, uh, graphics memory controller and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the graphics north bridge and the north bridge, we added another 256-byte uh, uh, path to, to be able to run coherent traffic along that. So that runs, and I'll show you in a minute how that comes together, but that runs in parallel. We maintained our existing direct path from uh, the graphics engine, graphics memory controller to memory, um, called our AD, AD, I'm sorry, Radian uh, memory bus. Um, that's for 3D graphics traffic, so non-compute traffic will follow that path to memory and, uh, and then is arbitrated right at the DRAM controller, and that's how we achieve the high uh, efficiency for, uh, for graphics traffic. Um, bringing in the rest, we have uh, four display engines on this, uh, all capable of 4K display and doing uh, um, uh, uh, post-processing right before uh, heading to the display. Uh, so some good capabilities there. And the AMD True Audio DSP section is on there as well. 
And last but not least is our uh, enhanced PCI Express Gen 3 uh, interface for discrete graphics. Um, okay, so a little bit about the hardware coherency. So in this generation, what we did is, is we needed a path for compute traffic. Uh, and, and so what we do is in the programming model, uh, the programmer, we, we, will, we will determine um, at dispatch whether the traffic is going to go through the graphics uh, portion of the pipeline or be used as compute traffic. We added this sys controller in the GPU where that traffic is steered for any of the memory transactions, and it goes to a separate section of our graphics memory controller that we call Chub or, or Coherent Hub. And in that, uh, we have an IOMMU and address translation cache, and then we also manage uh, uh, coherency uh, through that with the CPU. Um, the other thing that we uh, include in this is, is a section for man doing atomics. And of course, every time I, in my past, anybody, I said, we support atomics, everybody says, well, what atomics do you support? So I just included the list. We have a full complement, so um, there you go. Um, important part of this I mentioned is the IOMMU. This is one of the most key parts of heterogeneous computing, um, and, and especially HSA, is the ability to share uh, data structures with the, with the host. And I'll show you in a, in a minute uh, an example of where that really plays out. So essentially here, um, if I, at the top little block diagram there that you see, is showing the traditional way that compute uh, CPU and GPU have communicated. And this is through a, uh, a series of cop data copies. CPU queues something up, uh, has to do a block copy to, uh, to um, pinned memory that the GPU works out of, that the OS is pre-allocated. Um, then the GPU, if it's an external GPU, would have to copy to its frame buffer, so you could have as many as two, uh, two copies, and then uh, the GPU can uh, go and do its work. With the IOMMU now, uh, both the GPU and, and, and the CPUs are working out of the same, in this case, x86 uh, PTEs or page table entries so that uh, uh, they can both be working uh, and doing uh, pointer as a pointer type compute. Very important part uh, of getting additional performance. And so this eliminates that extra copy that you'd have. Um, the way that page faults work with this is um, um, straightforward. The, the actual um, x86 uh, takes care of that, and this would be uh, uh, part of the OS. So what happens is, is the GPU will issue a, uh, a memory reference. Um, an ATS request would come in, uh, if, uh, assuming that it missed the uh, onboard um, address translation cache, would go search the page table. If it's in the page table, uh, the request would come back. It would be evaluated. If it's there, away things go. If there's a page fault, then a, a, a PRI a peripheral um, page, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, a page request um, interface uh, request is is sent, and uh, that is queued up for the OS. OS handles the page fault, writes the data back into the PTE, and, uh, and the process repeats. Uh, whereby now the GPU uh, is is queued up that the that the memory reference is there and ready to go, and uh, and then it's fetched. Um, now, it looks like a long ordeal to go through. The thing is with the GPU is, is this is a bandwidth machine, and so we have tons of outstanding requests queued up in the, uh, uh, in the memory controller, and so uh, the whole machine is set up to cover this, uh, and I'll show you an example of, of how that works in a minute here. Um, queuing is also a very important part of, of, of um, doing heterogeneous computing. Um, and in this case, what I'm showing here is an example of, of how things are done today when you do GPGPU type uh, computation. So the first thing is, is CPU says I've got some work for the GPU to do. It uh, uh, triggers a, a transfer to happen to the uh, OS. Uh, the data is copied to the pin memory, as I showed earlier. Uh, once that's done, the job can be queued, so back to the uh, CPU to do that. The OS will then pass the scheduling of the job over to the GPU. GPU starts the job, finishes the job, passes it, the data back across. Uh, ultimately, a buffer uh, has to be allocated by the application because there's a call back to the application. Once that's done, the data can be copied back and you've completed the work. The problem with this is, is that to cover all of that amount of time and queuing time, you need some pretty big jobs there that they're going to be uh, making it worthwhile to do. When we start overlaying the HSA on Kaveri, um, so the first thing is, is that uh, we eliminate the, um, the copies, because now I can do pointer as a pointer. I can do shared memory um, uh, out of the same pages in memory. So that eliminates that part. Um, system coherency uh, eliminates uh, some of the buffer uh, issues that you might have between uh, passing data between the, the different uh, uh, processing elements. 
Um, now we have signaling, uh, the notion of signaling here, and so that, that eliminates the necess necessity of, of um, uh, some of the handshake with the OS. And last but not la least, in HSA, there's the notion of user mode queuing, which takes things to the full length. This is the ability now for the application to queue directly to the GPU and, and completely bypass the, the OS. Uh, and that's not always used, but the hooks are all there for that. So if I show once we get rid of that, all this falls away, and there you go. You now can tighten now the amount of time, because we've cut all that intermediate latency, and, and you can queue straight up to the GPU. Okay, so I've been talking about HSA, or heterogeneous system architecture. Um, we talked about this, uh, AMD and other companies, in the tutorials last year's uh, uh, hot chips, so the proceedings are up there on that, and we went into deep detail on how this all works. Um, I've talked mostly about the hardware so far. I'm going to shift and talk a little bit about the software building blocks, and so we'll work our way up the stack. So the first thing here is, is, is our, our intent here was to be able to drop open standard um, software uh, and, and commonly used compiled software on top of uh, heterogeneous architecture and not also have to understand the underlying hardware architecture. So the first thing we have at the top of stack is what's called the h sale or har um, uh, the, um, the heterogeneous system architecture uh, intermediate layer. And I'll go into a little more on what that is. Um, we have an HSA runtime, and this is where the, the queues are created. Um, uh, we do allocation of memory and, uh, and device discovery. Device discovery here meaning understanding what the underlying uh, compute capabilities are. Um, and then uh, uh, here, as I mentioned, we have the ability to reference high-level um, uh, compilers such as uh, CLang LLVM um, and, uh, and generate uh, HSAIL straight out of that. So let's look at how this plays out. So the evolution of a software stack, in this case we have, um, what I'm showing here is, is the way the traditional software stack works. Uh, we would usually have, and this is for uh, heterogeneous computing, you'd have the applications at the top layer, layer. they may optionally drop down through uh, uh, some domain libraries, ultimately hit the, um, the, uh, uh, the runtime, and then a, a KVM at the bottom before they drop onto hardware. With uh, what we've enabled now, uh, we get a little bit more flexibility. Um, we now have the h sale that I mentioned in the middle. Um, we can now do a, a, a JIT uh, compile uh, on the fly. Um, we can also do direct user mode queuing. That's the arrow that's kind of on the, uh, on the left side there, the straight from hardware down to, I'm sorry, straight from the application straight to the hardware. So a lot of flexibility to get uh, anything from, from straight uh, leveraging a soft version all the way to uh, almost running on bare metal. So the h sale is essentially a standard that was, uh, uh, has been put together in, in the HSA consortium. And what it is is an inter intermediate language. And so it allows now a high-level compiler to compile and go exploit the parallelism and describe that parallelism in the code uh, at this inter to this intermediate language and then uh, not have to know what the underlying hardware is. And so this is in place now and, and allows this uh, progression from, from compiler down to uh, uh, hardware through the h sale as an intermediate level. And so that way that the hardware on, or the, the, I'm sorry, the application code on one end doesn't have to know the specific, uh, in the case of Kaveri, that it has eight compute units and four x86 cores. So how does that play out? What you would have then is the HL sitting as an intermediate layer and you drop the OpenCL app or the uh, Python or, or uh, C++ AMP code straight through, it compiled to the intermediate layer and then, uh, and then at uh, either runtime or, or comp compilation uh, do a targeted compile to the specific hardware. Here's a great example of a real um, uh, world example that's out there now. Um, this is the uh, Sumatra um, uh, Java 9 HSA enabled Java. And, uh, and you can see from the picture, it's very similar to what I just showed on the previous slide. And so this allows now the, um, uh, the you know, native APU acceleration to Java code, and the JVM will just at runtime uh, do a JIT on the, uh, on the intermediate code and, and put it right to the hardware. Okay, so um, I'll show you a couple of examples of use cases where um, you know, this, this type of heterogeneous computing really works out well. 
Um, so, so first of all, uh, anything um, where you're working with large natural user data sets and so on uh, are, is great for, for HSA and for heterogeneous computing. So the first one is binary tree searches, and um, uh, the beauty now is we can exploit very large databases. Uh, binary tree updates uh, can, can exploit our, our platform atomics. Uh, one thing that's uh, very nice now that we're working out of all of main memory is we can work with extremely large data sets, basically all of memory. And, uh, and then last but not least is a really interesting one. Historically, we've talked about CPU to GPU calls. Well, now we have the hooks to do a GPU back to CPU call to do a, you know, a callback so that the uh, uh, GPU code could go call back and run some, a small amount of code or, or some amount of code on the CPU that would be more appropriate and then make a callback to the GPU so we can go both directions. Okay, so just as an example of data pointers, um, the legacy model of the way this worked in the past is uh, you would have had uh, uh, the, the, the host queuing up something for the GPU. You would do the memory copy. Um, the next thing that would happen would be the GPU would operate on that to do the uh, data pointer operations. Of course, the CPU is just hanging out there not doing anything at this point. The results would come into a results buffer, again, working in pinned memory, and then the results would go back to uh, system memory, and, and you're done. So a lot of steps. If we start doing this with an HSA-accelerated uh, approach, you can see that we can just do a direct pass to the, to the uh, GPU. The GPU can do, work, do its work uh, out of main memory and then put the results right back uh, in, in main memory. They're all working out. So here's the code that we wrote. We actually wrote this code to uh, run on Kaveri um, to, to get a flavor of how fast things would speed up. And so uh, you can see the difference in code and all the overhead necessary on the right there to do the legacy approach versus the uh, parallel HSA approach, uh, eliminating all that intermediate uh, uh, gunk there to move the data around. Here is the results that we saw um, on, a, on a Kaveri system. And so you can see how dramatic the speed up was in this, uh, in this particular set of examples. And so this was a, a data pointer where we had uh, various node sizes in, in the tree search. Uh, uh, and uh, one subtle thing to point out here, a couple things. One is, is you'll notice there's, no, uh, there's orange bars there. Those were running on our legacy APU where we weren't doing uh, this uh, pointer as a pointer and data sharing. Uh, and you notice there's no uh, orange results on the larger node sizes there. And that's because the data set's too big to fit in pinned memory, so you can't do it. So now that with, with, H, with HSA and our IOMMU, we're able to work out of all of memory, and so that even the larger data sets can be accelerated. The other thing you notice is that at, once we move to the larger data sets, we hit a peak at, uh, I believe it's 5 million um, nodes in the tree, and then we started to tail back off. And that what we're running into is essentially the number of outstanding TLB um, uh, fetches that we have to do to keep up with the, the larger tree size and the fact that the tree is much taller to work through. Um, but the degradation is not too bad. Okay, platform atomics is the second one, uh, and in this case, uh, very straightforward. Just basically what we're saying is the CPU and GPU can work out of a common uh, set of memory, and, and we have all the hooks there to do atomics between the two. Um, we do have a unified SDK available, um, to, so all the goodness around uh, doing the programmable components with an APU. Um, we also have uh, source libraries coming together, and, and these, uh, several of these are coming together real time to go ex accelerate and exploit the hooks that are in place. So as I've shown you, um, we now have the ability to talk about our GPU as, as just a, a first-class citizen in the, in, the CP, in, the, uh, in the APU. And so we can exploit all these flops. And so uh, uh, this is a lot of performance to, uh, to add to the table here. And we're seeing this now with, uh, with the increasing uh, uh, you know, types of data that we're processing. And so uh, this gives us a way to keep on that performance curve as we go forward. And uh, even with PC Mark version 2, uh, we're seeing that uh, being exploited with some of the OpenCL code go that going there. The other thing that's nice about this is it gives us a way to get uh, performance and power efficiency. And so, uh, so here, what you can see is I, we, we grabbed and plotted the uh, power efficiency that we've gained, and, and there's some fine text you can read there as to how we come up with power efficiency. Um, but uh, essentially with Kaveri, uh, in the past, what is it, about six years or so, we're, we've seen essentially about a 10x improvement in power efficiency. And this is coming not only from things like HSA, but, but more power management, 
development and uh, more integration, the, of course, the technology scaling uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. All of this is very important to AMD's initiative announced, uh, I believe it was last month, where we're pushing very hard to do a, a significant improvement in power efficiency out through 2020, so I encourage you to read up on, on what we're doing there. So in, in conclusion, um, with HSA, uh, I've shown you that uh, we have all the features here to, to give an optimized uh, uh, heterogeneous computing platform, really is the first generation of many generations to come. And so um, what I'm going to do is, I, I'm always like a show and tell guy. And so I'm going to show you a, a demo on, a, on an HP uh, notebook here that I just pulled out of the box before the trip. And let's just, so what this is, is the latest version of, of uh, Photoshop. Um, I just pulled the demo copy down the other day. Uh, we worked with Adobe on this. And so what's happening here is this is running a thing called Smart Filters. And this is a picture of a flower taken down on uh, downtown uh, San Jose. And what this is going to do uh, is, um, looks like it's up a minute, is it's going to run a filter first on the CPUs. And it takes a little bit of time to do this. Uh, this is called Smart Filter. It's a filter that's doing a um, uh, removing noise and then also sharpening the, uh, the picture. And uh, it was really tricky doing this demo because, uh, well, as you'll see in a minute, uh, uh, to find something where it didn't take too long uh, when it was running just on the CPUs to complete. Um, so uh, is it's finishing up. So this is on an HP Elite book, a uh, brand new notebook that just came out with Kaveri. Uh, it's a 19 watt TDP notebook. and. Uh, uh, very nice little notebook um, in, in kind of at, the, at the, the bottom end of our power envelope, so probably one of the lighter compute configs. Okay, and there it's done. It took a little while. So now what we'll do is um, we'll undo that, and now we'll go in, and, and Adobe did a nice thing and provided hooks to uh, go turn on the graphics. And in here is a setting to turn on OpenCL. So we worked with uh, Adobe to uh, speed this up when running on the GPU. And so now we'll run it one more time. And uh, let's see, sharpen. And here it goes. Pretty dramatic. <laughs> We've seen about an 11x uh, speed up when we run and push this over to the GPU. And uh, so you can see where this would be very handy uh, to, uh, to anybody that's doing photo photography and, and taking advantage of these, uh, these higher performance uh, 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 GPUs. So with that, uh, thank you. That's, that completes my talk. Great talk. Um, as usual, uh, questions on both sides. Uh, please introduce yourself uh, before asking questions. James Kim with Cadence. Uh, I have a question about the GPU and the IO MMU. Uh, I was wondering if there are caches inside the GPU, and with the IO, IO MMU being external, are the GPU caches physically indexed and physically tagged, or how does that work? Yeah, yeah, so uh, good question. In this particular implementation, the, um, uh, the address translation cache uh, is part of the uh, graphics memory uh, 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 controller. Um, so, um, uh, the, uh, um, so we go through an intermediate layer, and, and so all transactions are, are taken through that. And so all the, all the memory handling for the GPU is done at that point. Uh, we didn't put it into the, uh, into the uh, inner, inner part of the uh, cache subsystem in this generation. I'm Sanjeev from Oracle. Just a question about the user level queuing. Um, so is the user level commands are part of the hardware structure inside the processor or is it part of the memory? Uh, Basically the user level queue is part of the physical memory outside or is it part of 
some hardware structure, hardware queuing gotcha. structure inside the processor. Gotcha. No, this is all soft. Uh, it's all done in main memory, um, and so uh, uh, it's all part of the uh, the whole queuing infrastructure um, that, that sort of parallels the the driver level queuing uh, structure that we we have for graphics historically. Uh, but but it is a is soft queue, and uh, and there in the graphics engine there is a uh, a, a processor that then uh, fetches those jobs um, off the queues. Um, but but they are soft. It's not. Okay. Okay, hardware. so yeah. so what happened? Is this the pages on which this queue is created is pinned, or is it uh, is the kernel aware that th this will not be swapped out? Yeah, the, the, so it's not pinned. It's it's actually um, in main memory, and so the runtime uh, handles that, uh, and and so it becomes part of the the runtime driver that's 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 running in the background. My my, my point is is that let's say Linux or whatever is running on that, the VM subsystem of that will not swap out that particular page. How is that guaranteed? Yeah, I, mean, I can't answer that question, uh, not being quite the software guy, but uh, uh, um, yeah, yeah, sorry. And, and the third question is that, uh, how is the security uh, uh, part of it is handled? Because you're, you're interacting with the hardware structure directly from the user level mode, and I, have, I can always run a malicious thread on it, and. Uh, Completely compromise your. Yeah, hardware. I think th I think the way to think of this is is actually think of the uh, of the GPU as being essentially an extension of the of the CPU. They're both working out of the same uh, have the same uh, hierarchy and privilege levels and so on. So uh, just as if you were uh, running the thread on the on the CPU, same things happening here on the GPU. So everything's preserved in the in the x86. Uh, um, uh, you know, PTE memory management uh, or is VMM it? VMM. Sorry, yeah. So is it fair to say that security is per, uh, basically uh, kind of a user level process uh, dependent? Basically, it's a user's responsibility to ensure the security because. Uh, well, again, just like an application would not be able to, uh, uh, when you were running on on the host, um, would not be able to go places where it can't go based on the, uh, the the memory management, the VMM. Same thing goes with the GPU. I mean, There's what no I meant was that I can actually hog your memory. Basically. So maybe we should take this offline. So. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Hi, Jack Schaap from Nvidia. I had a question about your coherency. Um, is it uh, is a full cache coherency between the GPU and CPU, like with your L2 and L1, or just the L2? Yeah, in, in it's it's a bit subtle, but uh, but in this uh, particular device, the uh, GPU um, it's for GPU to uh, memory transactions. So the uh, the traffic for compute does uh, bypasses the graphics L2, and and goes straight to memory. So uh, CPU is coherent. Um, uh, GPU, it's uh, think of it as a, effectively a write through uh, arrangement for the GPU. Now what granularity is the coherency? So, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just finish. Uh, 4K, uh, sorry, page size? Uh, uh, the, or, the, oh, oh, CP. Granularity. It's, it's, uh, it's the uh, same, it's the regular cache, pa uh, I'm sorry, cache dot line size, 64 bytes. Yeah. Right, Sounds good. Let's All right. thank uh, Dan again. Thank you. OK, so the uh, last talk of the session is from uh, NVIDIA once again. Uh, so our speaker is uh, Daryl Boggs. Uh, Daryl is a distinguished engineer and the director of CPU architecture at NVIDIA. Uh, he's been building processors for almost 25 years. The first 13 years at Intel, he helped develop technologies in Pentium Pro and Pentium 4 and their various derivatives. And Daryl was the chief architect at Texar before joining NVIDIA and directing the development of uh, NVIDIA's Denver processor. Thank you very much. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, NVIDIA's uh, Denver processor. One of the biggest questions that I've had so far is, wow, it's been about time. So thanks for coming. Um, I'd like to uh, be able to talk to you today about uh, a lot of work that a lot of people have done. And I'd like to thank my co-authors, as well as our CPU team and, and, and also the program management team here at, at Hot Chips for allowing us to have this opportunity. So Mike Diddy talked to you a little bit about Tecra K1 and the 32-bit flavor of that. And today, I'm going to talk to you about Tecra K1 64. It's a dual Denver CPU processor. And it's the first 64-bit Android Kepler processor in the market today. 
Um, this is a family of processors, one in which we have a Tegra K132 that has 192 core Kepler uh, processing elements in it, both of which the 32 and 64-bit flavors have that Kepler GPU in it. The 32-bit flavor has a four-core A, Cortex-A15 in it, and the 64-bit version has our dual Denver CPU. These are a family of processors that are both pin compatible, so you can put both of these processors into the same socket, and they have the same thermal characteristics, and so they can be supporting the same devices, and Tegra K164 then therefore provides an upgrade path uh, on those devices without having to redesign the platform. So the value proposition for Denver is that when we got together as engineers and tried to des define what it was that we would do at NVIDIA for a CPU uh, strategy, we knew that we needed to create something that was different, something that would be unique in the marketplace and provide added value across a multiplicity of environments. So we decided not to build things that were already on the roadmap for other vendors like ARM, and we wanted to build an ARM CPU to provide an opportunity to extend the ecosystem. So we decided to build a processor that would provide the highest performance ARM uh, in, in, in the mobile space that was extremely energy efficient and that supported the ARM V8 instruction set. By providing this higher performance, we allow the opportunity to give better dynamic range between the CPU and the GPU, like Mike was talking about earlier, as well as extend the ability to, to have better battery life, to give a delightful user experience in the mobile, mobile space, and then to provide one more capability, to enable us to bring PC class performance directly into the mobile space on tablets and clamshells and those kinds of devices. We also enable um, content creation, we enable uh, higher end gaming, PC gaming in this platform, as well as enterprise applications. Oops, hope it doesn't go again. So let's talk a little bit about the Denver CPU. If you look at the diagram, basically what you see is a diagram like what people have been showing for probably the past 15 years or so. Something that has a branch predictor, it has an instruction cache, it has a hardware decoder feeding a scheduler and feeding some superscalar architecture. Denver is a seven wide superscalar architecture. It's fully compatible with all V8 uh, instruction set for ARM. It, it, it executes ARC, ARCH64 ARC and ARCH32 instruction sets and it provides all of this programmability that you will expect to obtain through compatibility with ARM V8. In addition to that, we've built into the subsystem a very aggressive hardware prefetcher and the, a mechanism to go find secondary misses after a first miss into this architecture to overlay receiving of memory data behind the shadow of a first miss. But the unique thing about this architecture is that on top of this base level hardware, we've built what we call a dynamic code optimization technique. And what that is, is the ability in software to dynamically, using profile guided data, optimize the ARM code into microcode, and then execute that microcode over and over again for every execution instance of that code, such that we yield out-of-order performance and execution out of this in-order core without any of the power necessary by the complex data structures and scheduling algorithms that have come to be known in the industry of an out-of-order core. This provides a little bit simpler core as well as the ability to have more energy efficiency. <clears throat> Let's compare and contrast Tegra K132 and Denver, or Tegra K164. On the left, we have the Cortex A15 basic block diagram, and on the right, we have the, the Denver block diagram. At that level, they look pretty much the same. But let's look at some of the differences. 
One of the differences that you first might notice is that the Cortex-A15 is only capable of sustaining three instructions per cycle because its decoder is only three wide. So the maximum number of ARM instructions that the Cortex-A15 can execute is three. On the other hand, Denver, once it's optimized the code, has the ability to fetch and deliver to the scheduler up to eight ARM instructions per cycle. The back end of the machines on the Cortex-A15 side is able to execute eight micro operations per cycle, but on the Denver side, we're able to execute seven. So our ILP, or instructions per cycle, that we can execute with our fetch bandwidth as well as with our execution bandwidth is up to seven, and in some instances, when we reduce work, seven plus instructions per cycle. And we have actual instances where we've seen execution for some sustained periods of time of up to seven instructions per cycle. In addition, there are several other very interesting points that are different between the Cortex-A15 and Denver. One of them is, traditionally, many of the machines that have been built in our industry have had a, essentially two instruction pipes. And that's what Cortex-A15 has. What we've done inside of Denver is we've doubled that to be four. And we didn't want to put two full additional integer pipes into the machine, so what we did is we took the memory pipe and recognized that there are times when the memory pipe isn't fully utilized, and we allowed the memory pipes to be able to execute simple integer operations, thus in allowing us to double at times our integer throughput through this machine. The other element that's quite different between these two is that in the Cortex-A15, they have a they support all floating point and neon operations, but they only support that with a 64-bit data path. Now, as you know, might know, neon is a 128-bit data path necessary item. So in order for A15 to execute those, they have to either double pump one of the execution units or split it and use both pipes to get the full 128-bit operand created. On Denver, we created two full 128-bit data path floating point and neon execution units, thus enabling us to effectively double our throughput on floating point operations compared to the Cortex-A15. The other thing that is quite unique about the Denver architecture is that on the memory path, Cortex-A15 is able to do one load and one store per cycle. Denver, on the other hand, is able to do two loads or two stores, or any combination of the two in a given cycle. So we have a lot more memory throughput, a lot more flexibility on our memory pipes than uh, does the Cortex-A15. That enables us to get the performance levels that are much higher than the traditional ARM cores that are currently in the market. <clears throat> One question that I'm often asked is, well, what's your pipeline length? Well, how do you define pipeline length? There's a lot of them. So one of them I thought I would share today is to describe for you our, our uh, branch misprediction pipeline. For us, our branch misprediction pipeline when running uh, optimized code is 13 cycles, and that's comparable to the 15 cycle branch misprediction penalty that you would see in Tegra K132. What that allows is it allows us to be slightly more efficient and then coupled with our better branch predictor, which you can see some statistics in the lower left-hand corner with regard to that, um, we're able to get higher ILP as well as more energy efficiency when executing branchy code than what Cortex-A15 is able to do. Another question that's often asked is, well, what about the companion core? And uh, NVIDIA's been uh, in their Tegra line having companion cores in their processors, what did you do for Denver? Well, since we had the opportunity to be able to build our own CPU, we decided that we would take some of the problems that are solved by a companion core and incorporate fixes to those into our own CPU. We can't change ARM's IP, but we can create our own IP within our own core. So we, we added a new power state that we call CC4. 
What CC4 is, is, the, is a means of being able to retain state internal to the core, both uh, architectural state as well as cache state, but to reduce the voltage below the active vmin voltage, retain the state in the arrays, and thus greatly lower the leakage threshold that you receive when you go into this power state. And what you can see on the, on the right-hand side, I guess it's your, your left-hand side, side um, in the graph is that when you do clock gating, which is the, a typical thing, you can't get down to a very low uh, voltage thresh, uh, energy threshold, but clock gating can, can happen very, very quickly. So you often want to go to a power gated state or rail gated state, which is the blue line, but the cost and overhead associated with that of flushing the caches and uh, saving and restoring the state and then reloading all of that data when you come back out uh, is problematic. And the graph is showing the amount of energy that it takes or power that it takes as a function of the idle cycles or idle time. If the idle period is very long, say 400 milliseconds, then you ought to power gate the, the core. But if the idle cycle is, say, 10 milliseconds, power gating the core actually costs you energy and you expend more energy and you don't save anything in, in flushing the state and then reloading it. So what we did is we put in this CC4 state, which gets very fast entry and exit times and gets the level idle power state approximating that of rail gating and allows us to save a fair bit of energy for much, much shorter idle duration times. Okay. The, as you push those curves to longer duration times as they go to the right, basically what you're seeing is the expense of entry into that state and exit out of that state. And so you can see that this CC4 state that we've added has approximately the same entry cost as clock gating does, and a much lower power saving or power expenditure than does the clock gating state. So in our core for Tegra K1, we don't have a companion core, and we actually use this as the means of getting those low power uh, states for Tegra K1, 64. So now let's talk about what is the fundamental innovation. And what I'd like to do is to try and describe for you how does dynamic code optimization work inside of Tegra K164 or Denver. As you're, as you're well aware, we start out essentially like your, all the machines that you know and love. We begin to fetch the code, happens to be ARM code in our case. We fetch those instructions, we give them to the hardware decoder, the hardware decoder decodes them and then schedule them onto the execution data path. As it executes those codes, it profiles that data. One of the things that it profiles in the branch execution unit is it profiles how many times we happen to execute a particular branch target. It keeps track of, uh, in, a, in a table, and when we execute this branch target, it increments the counter. We go on and we execute some more code, and we see that branch target again, we'll increment that counter again. Ultimately, that counter will uh, overcome some threshold, and what will happen is an optimization micro interrupt will be signaled to the hardware. Now, this isn't an interrupt that you would know and love from an operating system perspective. It's one that's just totally internal to the machine. It notifies the base level hardware in the machine that there is likely code that's being used enough that it would make sense to go optimize that code. And the optimizer then will take <clears throat> that dy dynamic profile guided information, performance counters, tables that we've created inside of the architecture, it extracts that information from the hardware and then utilizes the instruction stream to go and optimize that code. That optimization can be done either here on the foreground thread by preempting it, or, better yet, on an idle processor 
thus allowing the foreground thread to continue to make forward progress. The kinds of things that the optimizer does is it renames registers, it unrolls loops, it breaks false dependencies in the code, it improves the scheduling algorithm of that code, um, and various other things. It eliminates codes um, to optimize that code specifically for the hardware that it's going to be run on, as well as using all of that profile-guided data to make intelligent decisions about how that code is running now on the machine and optimizes those routines and then stores them into what we call an optimization cache. Now, when it's doing this optimization, in the hardware of our out-of-order machines of today, the largest window that it can try and extract instruction-level parallelism out of is about 192 operations or instructions. Our optimizer, the dynamic code optimization, looks across thousands of instructions to extract the instruction level parallelism and pack those routines into this optimized routine and then stores that in the optimization cache. So you're able to get a much broader window, find many more opportunities to extract ILP, and then utilize that over and over and over for each execution instance of that routine, thus amortizing all of the cost of optimization across the many execution instances of those routines. This optimization cache is stored in main memory. It's not a caching structure inside of the processor. It's 128 megabytes of main memory that's carved off of the system memory before the operating system even comes up. So the operating system doesn't know about it, it can't get access to it, and we have it secured so that the process and the codes in it are secure. The last thing that the optimizer does is it puts into the processor, the core, into a table, uh, a, an IP pair, the branch arm target IP, and the IP in the optimization cache for the optimized code. So now we come back and we're executing this code on the foreground thread, and we come to this branch target and the fetch unit wants to fetch that branch target in ARM space, it looks up in this optimization lookup table and finds, oh, I have an optimiz optimized routine to go execute. And so it goes and it fetches that optimized routine out of the optimization cache. Those UOPs get stored in the instruction cache, sent down, bypassing the hardware decoder, and execute on the execution unit. We see, over a, we see two and sometimes over 2x speed up over the base level hardware architecture using these optimized routines for the very same code um, having been optimized by our dynamic code optim optimizer. As time goes on, we continue to gather profile information. They, we, as we see the, the, the profiles come through, the optimizer may be kicked in and adjust the optimization that's been seen uh, and created for that routine. And it also finds that, as you well know, one routine calls another routine, calls another routine. And rather than look them up in the optimization lookup table every time, the optimizer goes and dynamically chains all of these optimized code sequences together, and then we don't have to look up in the optimization routine. We just execute all of those optimized routines out of the optimization cache as if it were the original code. So that's effectively how dynamic code optimization works. So what I'd like to do now is to give you a little bit of feel for what the performance looks like. So we put, took some representative benchmarks that uh, are typically used in the industry, um, DMIPS, SPEC, Antutu, and some others, Octane. And we're giving you a feel for what the performance looks like of Tegra K1, which is 100% on this graph. So all of these are relative to Tegra K1 32. And then the green bar on the, on the right is what Denver is performance relative to the following processors. There's a Bay Trail, which is shipping today. Uh, there's a Crate processor that's there that's in shipping today. There's uh, Apple's a A7 Cyclone that's there in the iPhone. Uh, and then there's a Has Haswell that's in a, in a Chromebook. Um, and what you can see is that for all of the ARM processors on this, on this chart, as well as the Bay Trail, Denver is significantly outperforming 
all of those processors on all of these benchmarks. And in effect, looking at the comparison with Haswell, Denver is effectively producing the performance of the Haswell uh, in, in, for all of these benchmarks. In some we beat Haswell, and others Haswell barely beats us. Um, so in effect, we're bringing that PC class performance into the ARM ecosystem to be delivered in all of these mobile platforms. Now, let's talk a little bit about how this machine works over time as it executes an actual program. So what I'm showing you here is a <clears throat> execution profile of active cycles on the CPU as our machine executes Crafty, which is one of the spec benchmarks, a uh, chess game. And um, the yellow portions of each of these bars is the amount of active cycles that the hardware decoder is executing the code, where it's decoding the ARM code and then shipping those to the execution units. The dark color up on the top is the amount of active cycles on the core that is being dedicated to optimize this ARM code that's flowing through the machine. And then the big green bars are the time that we're executing optimized code out of the optimization cache. The next thing that's kind of important to look at is how much code is being seen that has never been seen before. So this second bar is a graphic of new code as it arrives over time when running Crafty on the machine. And then the last bar that everybody's always uh, wanting to know is, well, what's the performance profile look like? So we're graphing the instructions per cycle over time for this very same application. And what you can see is at the very beginning of the program, as you would expect, there's a boatload of brand new code. And as a result of having a boatload of brand new code, that code begins to execute on the instruction decoder. But almost instantaneously, we recognize that there's hot code that needs to be optimized. And we optimize that code, and lo and behold, we begin to execute that, even in the very first time slice. And by the way, this, this picture is for the entire run of Crafty. Um, what you can see from an IPC perspective is it starts out just above the base level hardware performance and then ramps over time until it reaches a fairly steady state of 1.2 1 1 to 1.5 IPC for this particular benchmark. <clears throat> the next period of time, we're still getting some new ARM code in. We're still kicking off the optimizer for that, that new ARM code. We're still building some new uh, optimization routines in the cache. This period of time, also, the optimizer is chaining things together and enabling them to uh, be better optimized. And then the next section of code, what we see is we get a board change in the chess game, which brings a, a bunch of new ARM code. We execute some of that through the hardware decoder. We build some new routines. And then for the remainder of the program, it's fully executing out of the optimization cache. Okay, until you get to the very, very end and you'll see some new code, which is the teardown code for the benchmark, and we write the results. And what I thought I'd do is just blow up the very front section of this. So this is 3% of the benchmark. Okay, a very short period of time of the benchmark, we run, uh, we ramp up all of the optimization, we ramp up all of the performance of the machine until we reach that steady state there at the end. So, conclusions. I'm going to make a bold statement. I believe that dynamic code optimization is an architecture of the future. Why is that bold? Well, people have tried to do binary translation in the past and have not been successful. Many of the things that have been not done well in binary translation machines, we've fixed in our implementation here in Denver. I'm not saying that dynamic code optimization is something that will overtake out-of-order machines. 
I'm saying that dynamic code optimization is a quiver, is an arrow in the quiver of an architect to utilize just like all of the other techniques in the machine. Okay? As we utilize that, we'll be able to break the out-of-order barrier that's caused by hardware. We'll be able to open up synergy more between hardware and software, and we'll be able to provide much more energy efficient and performance machines in the future. Good talk. Once again, questions on both sides. Please introduce yourselves. Uh, let's start from this side. I see more people here. Hi, Mohammed Abdullah, SMI. Uh, I have a question on the chart that you showed for the performance. So in order to better appreciate uh, that chart, uh, there are a few things that are missing there. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, Denver is a 64-bit uh, architecture. So is this uh, performance measured, for example, on Haswell and uh, Denver for 64-bit code? That's the first question. And the uh, reason for that... Uh, I'm going to limit everyone to one question. Okay. There's a lot of people, so try okay. to keep your questions crisp. Okay. The, the reason for that is that uh, if you have as a Denver 64-bit registers, I mean, they are more registers than the, the number of 32-bit on Haswell. So you are unfairly using your optimizer to, you know, use the extra registers to gain about 15, 20 percent of the, you know, all the stuff that you said there. And uh, the frequency is the other missing thing. Without frequency, we, you know, there is no performance per clock to really measure the goodness of the architecture. That, Thank you. So, you. so the answer to your question is, there is a, it's an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Um, there are 64-bit codes in that, and there are 32-bit codes in that. The, the shipping frequencies are the frequencies that all of those are using. So you can go look up all those parts. You can look at the frequencies. Denver's running at 2.5 gigahertz, and um, the Tegra K132 is running Haswell, at 2.3. Haswell, what frequency Haswell is running? Haswell's running at 1.4. OK. Question yeah, side. The question I have, so uh, Bill just, Rash. Just, just to finish that thought, right? Um, all of these are in a tablet form factor. So I can't run a Haswell at three gigahertz and have that be in a tablet form factor. So keep that in mind as you think about that problem. Uh, Bill Rash, uh, Intel. Uh, I was asking about the uh, hardware execution characteristics. Uh, does what? Functions can the hardware execute out of order independent of the load after a load miss, which you mentioned early in the presentation? Well, as I tried to explain, we reorder uh, all computational ops, we, or, we reorder memory ops um, in the di dynamic code optimizer to enable essentially the same kind of out of order nature that you see in the hardware that's built by Intel and the processors that they built. Okay, yeah. How okay. wide is your, hard, your hardware sorry, decoder? Uh, can I, uh, there's a lot of people here, so I'd like to make sure so everyone gets a chance. So our hardware decoder is two instructions wide. Go ahead. Hi, Charlie Demergent, semi-accurate. Thank you for finally uh, outing this core. Um, how does the translated ops compare to ARM ops? You, can, you say you can have an IPC or an execution of seven plus per cycle. Uh, how does that map to the untranslated ARM uh, instructions? So many of the ARM instructions are able to be mapped one-to-one -one from an ARM instruction to a micro-instruction in our machine. And those are the most commonly executed instructions. Do you have, do you have a throughput for ARM instructions, or like a rough IPC for ARM instructions? Well, given that I didn't build the ARM cores that we're comparing to, and I don't know how they break their ops into micro-ops, I can't hazard not, a guess. Not micro-ops, the untranslated macro. Not sure I understand your question. Later. OK. Uh, left hand side there. Uh, do you need to uh, flush the optimization cache from time to time? If yes, uh, what kind of uh, hooks do you have put in? I think what you asked me is do we flush the optimization cache from yes. time to time? Yes. It isn't necessarily flushed, but as you can well imagine, we have to have a mechanism of knowing when um, code changes. And so whenever code changes, we may invalidate um, s uh, code that we've optimized. And then, um, it, say a page changes, we, all the translations or optimizations that are on that page get marked as being not able to be used, and then we'll revalidate whether they've actually changed 
and enable us to execute them again. Okay. And Satoshi Matsushita NEC, and you told that the, the, you are the, taking advantage of, of in the, the dynamic code optimization. The, you told that the, you are uh, taking advantage of a larger uh, or scheduling window. The, normally, the lot of branches and the load store are the, uh, 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 limits uh, the optimization window, and we uh, we are, uh, traditionally we use uh, trace cache or some sort of hardware support. What kind of hardware support do you have? That's a really wonderful question. I'd love to entertain that question, but those types of details are things that I'm not disclosing here today. Oh, okay. Is that a fair question? <laughs> Thank you. Mark Augustin, Samsung. Hi. Um, could you comment on your floating point performance in terms of uh, latency execution time on the FMAC? and maybe the multiplier? Um, what I'll say is you can imagine them to be very comparable to the Cortex-A15. Thank you. Okay, thank you for keeping all the questions very crisp. Go ahead. Uh, generally, Huawei technology. Uh, regarding CC4, uh, how did you achieve the latency of cloud gating while well, the benefit of uh, power gating or DVFS? Um, I missed that part. Yeah, so the, the entry and exit latencies of CC4 essentially are dominated by controlling the regulator, right? Since there is no necessity to be able to flush the caches or save the state, um, the fundamental dominant factor is being able to control the regulator to, to lower the voltage from the active V-min voltage to the retention voltage. Okay. John Delaney. I was wondering, how is your form of dynamic code translation going to have a better outcome than Transmeta's form of dynamic code translation? That is a really wonderful question. Let, let me see if I can help set the stage for how it's different. One of the things that was a little bit problematic in Transmeta's dynamic code optimization is that the very first thing when Transmeta sees a piece of code, it uses hundreds of instructions to translate that code. And so there's this enormous cliff between not seeing code before and getting code optimized. That caused two things to happen. One, the cliff was visible, problem number one. Problem number two is it caused the need and the necessity to optimize things to be, you must do it now, the first, almost the first time you see anything. So what we did was we built upon a very good hardware base architecture so that the first time you see an instruction, it executes reasonably well. That's one. Two. We've allowed and built into this architecture the ability to get out of the way of the running thread. Since the hardware is fully capable of running the, the code anyway, let the hardware run the code and go do the optimization as and when the code, a, a, a core is free. So that optimization penalty isn't necessarily seen by the foreground thread. Okay? And those two things coupled together with a fair amount of other juju that I'm not going to talk to you about today um, <laughs> is what's enabling us to make this very useful and capable in machines today. If you look at the, I, I wish I could, could have brought a device for you here to play with. If you look at the, the devices that are being built with Tegra K164 in them, the users experience issues that were seen with Transmeta's devices you don't see with Tegra Okay, so we, we have, uh, I'm going to take one last question there and maybe two questions here. Uh, we are five minutes into the break, and I'm sure everyone wants to go get something to eat. So, uh, Christy. Hi, Christy Sanovich, UC Berkeley. I was curious why you used only SPEC 2000 and not 2006 in the benchmarks. Does it blow your cache translation size? <laughs> Do you want to comment on the translation cache size and where it is and how big it is? Yeah, so I, I mentioned in the, in the talk when, how big it is. It's in main memory, it's 128 megabytes. Um, but the real reason for using SPEC2K is that most 
In fact, all today uh, mobile devices don't have enough memory to run Spec 2006. So just can't run it, right? So um, I used what you could run and what, for, what you could go and produce if you were trying to go reproduce the results. Okay, last question from the left. Crisp, please. Mike Rizzoni. Die size, metal layers, L2, L3, cache size. The L2 cache size is um, two megabytes. It's 16-way set associative. Um, I'm not disclosing die size today, metal layers, physicalities of the design, um, that kind of stuff. Okay. Last question. Okay. Uh, hopefully, last question here. Ben Eckerman from Freescale. Um, so you compared uh, versus the A15 as well as various competitor custom cores. Um, how about versus the A57 from ARM in terms of either absolute performance and or performance per watt? Um, I would love to be able to share that information with you. However, I'm under a non-disclosure agreement to not be able to talk about um, competitors' parts that aren't publicly available. The, A50, the A57 is publicly available as far as I'm aware. Where, where is the A57 shipping? I know of no devices that an A57 is in it. Okay, I, so I can't get my hands on it, therefore I can't disclose that information. So Daryl is going to be available here for offline questions that don't get recorded in the video camera, so please feel free to come by. <laughs> uh, so with that, thank you very much.